Okay, maybe we can uh, start uh, presenting Professor Julie today. Um, and also, well, first of all, uh, giving our warmest welcome to everybody uh, from different universities and from different countries that accepted to be here to, to hear uh, Professor Julia uh, lecture. Um, this is one, the second one of this year's uh, lectures offered by the Institute for Medieval Studies. And we have today with us uh, Professor Julia Day, who is a docent uh, and university okay. lecturer uh, in church history in the Faculty of Theology um, in the University of Helsinki and Senior Research Fellow in Early Christian Liturgy at Blackfriars Hall, University of Oxford. Uh, her research focuses on early Christian liturgy, especially that of Jerusalem and Palestine in late antiquity, and on the interpretation of ancient and contemporary liturgical texts. Her publications include The Baptismal Liturgy of Jerusalem, 2007, Reading the Liturgy, 2014, Early Roman Liturgy to 600, also from 2014, A Guide to the Study of Liturgy and Worship from the previous year, and the Oxford Handbook of Early Christian Ritual from uh, 2018. She has been one of the invited keynote speakers at the last conference of medieval Europe in motion that took place in the monastery of Bataille in November of last year on uh, materiality and devotion, and will grant um, our undergraduate and graduated students with two classes on the next two days. And today, a lecture will be on Eucharistic materiality and lay liturgical experience in the early Middle mm -hmm. Ages. So we we'll, we'll, are very glad to have uh, Professor Juliet with us today. Um, we are very sorry not to be able to uh, to welcome you in here in Lisbon um, yeah, personally, but uh, we are with you today to listen to, to your conference. And we'll only ask for people who are uh, listening to switch off their sound and video after the professor starts a lecture and to put the questions, um, if you have some questions or doubts in the chat so that we can um, we can have your questions and doubts for the debate that will follow the, uh, the lecture. So I'll give um, the word to Professor uh, Juliet today, uh, thanking you again for uh, being with us in this uh, late Monday. <laughs> okay. Lovely. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Okay. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Honor and pleasure to be with you. And um, of course, I am very disappointed not to be enjoying uh, the pleasures <laughs> of, uh, of Lisbon and Portugal at the moment. But uh, I shall I shall wait for those <laughs> a bit later on. So thank you for the invitation. So uh, the um, my topic today is, as we say, we're going, I'm going to look at uh, the material aspects of uh, the Eucharist and what that can tell us about uh, the liturgical and ritual uh, experience of the laity. From the end of the fourth or early fifth century, the newly baptized in Jerusalem were given these instructions about how to receive the cup at the Eucharist. And after the communion of the body of Christ, approach the cup of his blood. Do not hold out your hands, bow down worship and adoration saying amen and sanctify yourself by receiving the blood of Christ and while your lips are still damp moisten your hands and sanctify your eyes forehead and your other senses the fourth and the fifth uh, of the catechesis Mr. Gogike attributed to Bishop Cyril of Jerusalem described the Eucharist to guide the newly baptized future participation in the community ritual. The explanation of the communion with the cup has two parts. The first presents ritual instructions. They go to where the cup is being held. Uh, the cup does not come to them. They bow their heads in a posture with practical as well as respectful connotations. They are not to extend their hands, that is, they do not take and they do not hold the chalice. 
The second part is what we might call a devotional instruction in that it permits sanctification of the senses via the materiality of the consecrated wine. This is one of the few references to lay communion that we have from the late antique and early medieval periods. It is notable for the ritual autonomy permitted to the laity in their use of the wine, which contrasts with the gradual removal of the cup from lay Eucharistic experience in the later medieval centuries. Because receiving the cup was such a normal activity, related as it is to everyday drinking, it required no description or explanation, except when new rules were introduced or uh, incorrect behavior was corrected. Hence, we only find uh, some references to lay communion in conciliar canons, but rarely find a reference to it in liturgical sources. And so if the textual sources are lacking or inadequate, then perhaps we can turn to the material and visual evidence, and this will be the aim of today's investigation. The focus of my study is the laity, but identifying who is lay is important in light of the expanding clerical cursus and the growth of monasteries. Lisa Bailey, in her book, The Religious Worlds of the Laity in Late Antique Gaul, noted how increasingly carefully people were being distinguished by their place in the ecclesial or spiritual hierarchy, which was also demonstrated by proximity to the altar and the sacraments. As Bailey shows for Gaul, the laos, the people, become the seculares, the worldly. They are distinct because they marry, they conduct business in the world, and apart from baptism, they occupy no institutional position in the church. And it's these ordinary lay people that I wish to focus on. Rituals in religious communities create identities. They reveal and enact hierarchies which are inherent, inherent to those identities. And this is most clearly evident at the moment of communion. The Constitutiones Apostolicae uh, from Antioch in 380 uh, gives this sequence for receiving communion. First the bishop, then the higher clergy, then the minor clergy, male ascetics, female ascetics, children, and lastly it says all the people according to their rank. From the West, Ordo Romanus Primus, dated to around 750 by Andrio, not only indicates a communion sequence starting with the Pope and ending with the laity and lay officials, but also that ecclesial and social hierarchies are maintained by the rank of the minister who administers communion to different sections of the congregation. The material elements of religious ritual also participate in identity formation and the maintenance of hierarchy, just as much as they reveal the divine and the immaterial. And this is what David Chidester explored in his book, Religion, Material Dynamics. Power is attributed to objects, but these objects also give power to individuals. In Chidester's analysis, these material objects operate within a nexus of ideas about the sacred, space, and time. Ritualization attends to the sacred, and enables an exchange between the mundane, the material, and the spiritual. Thus material objects, such as a communion cup, become part of this exchange. Through ritualization, space becomes meaningful when it is set apart, and in the power relations manifested in issues about access and meaning. But the spaces of communion function as one of Chidista's material dynamics of religion. Exploring the position of the laity of men and women, young and old, socially superior and socially inferior, when attending church and at the moment of communion, reveals the interactions between their particular status and their distinctive ritual practices. Men and women were typically separated on the right and left sides of the church but some sources indicate a more precise arrangement. The third century Didascalia Apostolorum, which was highly influential in later church orders, 
place the bishops and presbyters in the east, then the men in front of the clergy, and at the back, the women. It also uh, insists that distinction should be made for those who are honored in the world and according to age. In the fourth century Basilica at Aquileia, the east end was separated by a wooden chancel barrier and reserved for the clergy. But the mosaic patterns on the floor may, according to Vatagin, indicate the position of different members of, of the congregation. The most important were likely to be in front of the chancel, where the patterns were more ornate. And towards the west, there are much more simpler patterns, and that may indicate, he suggests, space for the less important members of the congregation. Order Romanus Primus indicates that in Santa Maria Maggiore, the leading men occupied the senatorium to the right of the chancel. That opposite them was the Pangero Fedarum, and the ordinary laity were towards the rear of the church. This spatialized hierarchy extends to where different categories of the congregation receive communion. The Second Council of Tours in 567 ordered that the laity were to be outside the chancel during the liturgies, but were permitted to enter the Sancta Sanctorum for communion. By contrast, the First Council of Braga in 561 appealed to the <clears throat> ancient canons in forbidding the laity be in the sanctuary for communion. The Fourth Council of Toledo in 633 insisted that, and uh, I quote in translation, the priest or bishop and Levite, that is the deacon, should communicate in front of the altar, the clergy in the choir and the people outside the choir. The canons reflect a general anxiety about the proximity of the laity to the material representations of the sacred in both places and objects. Dietrich has demonstrated the value of church inventories as sources for the materiality of particular church communities. These also indicate distinctions in clerical and lay communion, as even the poorest church might own many chalices of different material, decoration and size. The Liber Pontificalis is particularly informative although the generous patronage of Roman churches by emperors and popes cannot be considered typical. For example, the earliest inventory attributes to Pope Sylvester of 314 to 335, uh, these gifts to the titular church of Equitius. One gold chalice of two pounds, so that's about 650 grams. Five calices ministerialis, each one well, two pounds, so again, around 750 grams. <laughs> Plus two silver skiffi of 10 pounds. And that's uh, quite a lot of silver. That's over three kilos of silver. Calique's ministerialis were larger and designed for communion of the people. A representation of the variety of vessels that could be owned by a single church can be found in a bas relief on the portal of Monza Cathedral, and this uh, relief should be dated to before 1346. Beside a depiction of Queen Theodolinda, um, who is in the centre in the smaller picture, if I get my cursor um, uh, uh, up here, <laughs> um, is uh, Theodolinda handing items to St John the Baptist, the patron of the church, um, is this visual inventory in the larger picture here, um, uh, including four chalices of different sizes and shapes. And we can see we have two chalices here and two here. And this is a, not a pattern, this is a rather strange um, silver plate with chickens on it. I don't quite understand why, but it must have been important to the people of Monza. <laughs> um, it still exists in the, uh, in the um, uh, museum of, uh, uh, in Monza, uh, that thing, you can look it up for yourself. Uh, more accurately dated to the 6th century are the eight chalices from the small parish church of Sergios at Kappa Caraon in Syria. So these two examples show that uh, churches owned many different chalices. They were of different size, different decoration and shape, and suggest that liturgically, 
these chalices were used for different groups within the congregation and on different occasions. There are 64 late antique early medieval chalices which can be dated uh, to before uh, uh, around uh, 900. And these were catalogued by Michael Ryan, who added to the, uh, some new finds to a very comprehensive list uh, published in uh, 1966, uh, a catalogue published by Victor Elburn. If there is little or no textual or visual evidence to indicate how they were used, then perhaps the interpretation needs to come from these artefacts themselves. And this is the point made by Heather Hunter Crawley in her investigation of some of these 6th century Syrian Eucharistic vessels from Kappa Carion. Hunter Crawley's aim was to examine, and I quote, how the material properties of these objects enable particular sensory engagements and uses, uh, end of quote, by applying Carl Nappet's notion of the affordances of objects. This suggests a method by which an object can itself reveal the ways in which it was used and encountered independently of any textual sources. And it extends our examination uh, of these objects beyond descriptions of just the external features like size and decoration. In thinking through material culture, Carl Nappett emphasized that material culture should be understood in relation to the human subjects which create or find and use it. The affordances of an artifact imply by their material form and construction a, relation, a relationship to human ways of thinking, behaving and doing. The affordance of an artifact reveals how it functions in relation to human actions. This may be directly perceived on the basis of its shape and external features or indirectly perceived cultural associations which connect this object to similar and other familiar uh, artifacts. So affordances should also be understood in terms of the what uh, Napat calls the action repertoires of human protagonists. The artifact is to be understood within an active context of use, even if at that particular moment of investigation it is being used or not. The excellent studies of liturgical vessels by Ryan and Elburn uh, in their comprehensive catalogues uh, describe the material, uh, uh, the shape of it, the size, how it was made, what the decoration is. But these only suggest the liturgical function and they do not uh, address the cultural associations. If we consider uh, the cultural uh, associations um, of drinking, in a community familiar with the ritual of the Eucharist, the primary signification of a cup when depicted in a church building is with the blood of Christ and with ritualized drinking at the Eucharist. Thus a cup can act as a symbol of the Eucharist as we see here on the, uh, a panel from the chancel screen of San Apollinario in Rina. And so any cup uh, in an ecclesial context particularly when it's situated near an altar uh, or in an image with a cup uh, in proximity to an altar may suggest the Eucharist, uh, even if uh, the immediate context is non-Eucharistic. As for Nappert's action repertoires, the properties of a chalice may suggest how it functions in the Eucharist ritual as a container of sacramentalized wine and water and as a drinking vessel. The affordances of a chalice uh, suggest how it can be held in the hand, how it is offered to and received by the communicant. The form of uh, the points of contact with the communicant um, suggest ways of drinking from it. The rarity of descriptions of lay communion may be explained by Constant Classen's observation, uh, and I quote, the corporeal practices and sensory values that define life may be so pervasive that they are taken for granted and left unmentioned. The history of touch is consequently often an inferred history. It must move sideways from a suggestive phrase to a characteristic practice, to an informative artifact or site, and even inward to one's own distinctive yet shared corporeal experience." End of quote. The writers of the sources that uh, we need to use 
are almost invariably clergy, whose privileged position at the Eucharist means that their sensorial experience of the Eucharist would have been different to that of the laity. As Klassen indicates, sensorial experiences are taken for granted, such that clerical writers assumed the laity had an identical sensorial experience to them, even when the ritual differed. She indicates that it might be possible to, and I quote, infer lay experience from, and I quote again, an informative artifact or site, or, and I quote, with shared corporeal experience. This is what the theory of affordances will enable us to do, I think, in relation to uh, the lay Eucharistic uh, uh, reception. Klassen's comments about touch extend to the other senses when we discuss lay communion with the cup. So the questions are, what sort of synesthetic experience might be inferred from the chalices when we consider them in the ritual context of lay communion? And there are three aspects to consider. First, the site of the chalice. It's unlikely that any except those higher status male laity positioned in front of the chancel would have seen the entire chalice. Similarly, at the moment of communion, whether the decoration and inscriptions were visible depended upon the way in which the chalice was offered and the physical position of the communion, communicant at the moment of reception. Secondly, the sense of taste. How do the affordances of the chalice affect the way in which the contents were drunk? And thirdly, touch. What sort of physical contact does the lay communicant have with the chalice? Touching the Eucharistic vessels is restricted to certain ranks of clergy. For example, in uh, the medieval ordinals, the instruments of office for a subdeacon are an empty chalice and pattern, signifying the subdeacon's role in carrying these objects to the altar. However, once they are on the altar, only deacons, priests, and the bishop may touch them. At the moment of communion, the touching the chalice with the lips only was permitted. For example, the Council of Auxerre in five, uh, between 561 or six, uh, 605 legislated that a woman must not accept the Eucharist with naked hands. And decoration on the sixth century pattern shows the apostles um, uh, receiving uh, the, um, uh, the bread with bare hands um, on this side. Uh, and the cup uh, with veiled hands. If you see uh, here, the hands have a, have a veil over the top. The affordances of chalices relevant to the investigation are, firstly, the size um, and volume indicate whether a chalice is a calyx ministerialis, that is one for the laity, uh, and the depth of the cup may suggest how its contents were consumed. Secondly, Features designed for holding the chalice by the minister suggest how the cup was offered to the laity. Thirdly, features of the rim or the lip of the cup as the primary place of contact with the facilitate drinking and prevent spillage. And fourthly, the decoration. Was this likely to have been visible at the moment of communion? What might the decoration have contributed to the experience of receiving the wine? Although two-handled chalices do not survive into the later medieval and Byzantine periods, evidence for them in the earlier period is widespread. They come in two styles, a cantharous type and a bowl type. The visual evidence of two-handled chalices often depicts a cantharous type cup. This is a tall, thin cup on a narrow stem and base with handles which extend uh, the, uh, the length of the cup. And this sort of cup uh, is seen here uh, in this uh, chancel screen from San Apollinari Nuovo. And the Eucharistic signification of the cup is demonstrated here by the Cairo uh, emerging from the cup by the grapevines coming around it uh, and surrounding it. And the peacocks either side uh, are suggestive of resurrection. Also from Ravenna in the mid sixth century church of San Vitale, a cup of this type appears in the mosaic of the sacrifices of Abel and Melchizedek on the south wall of the presbytery. 
between the two figures is an altar with Eucharistic Christ and the connection between these Old Testament figures and the Eucharist is made explicit in the Roman canon and liturgical scholars have assumed that something like the Roman canon uh, was probably used uh, in, uh, in Ravenna as well. And we also uh, note that this image is placed in the presbytery, it's extremely close to the altar. Um, there's a direct connection being made between these sacrifices here and the sacrifice on the altar. And what connects Melchizedek's non-Eucharistic sacrifice uh, with the altar is of course the Eucharistic elements, the bread uh, and the cantharous cup. One chalice of this type is in the Walter, uh, the Walter Newton Hoard, a collection of silver church plate deposited in the fourth century uh, in Cambridgeshire in England. Although there's no decoration which would confirm its identification as a chalice, it was found among other items with explicitly Christian inscriptions. Uh, from France, uh, there is also the gold uh, Gordon chalice, uh, which is a, also a cantharous uh, chalice of this type, dated to around the end of the fifth century. Um, it's very small and uh, richly decorated with semi-precious gems. It's surrounded with rubies um, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it is very small and that may well not have been for congregational use. The other two-handled chalices from this period are of the bowl type. These have smaller handles, are proportionally shorter and wider and are found in both east and west. The 6th century silver chalice uh, from the Maroteo de, de Tesmertes treasure and now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts has a wide bowl topped by a flat rim with, uh, with ring or thumb holes on either side and stands on a narrow fluted base. Just below the rim is an inscribed ban with a donor inscription and below on each side a gilded Christogram. Two somewhat similarly shaped chalices from Ireland are dated to the 8th century, the Ardar and Derry Finland chal chalices. Here the rim of the chalice is formed by a distinctive curved band, and on each side are ring handles with decorated mounts. We see a decorated gold band uh, with enamel studs, a gilded medallion containing a cross, uh, and there is uh, an inscription between the bowl and the foot, uh, naming the, uh, the, with among other things, the names of the apostles. Two other pieces of evidence uh, attest to the ritual use of these chalices can be added here. In Order Romanus Primus, at the end of the canon, the archdeacon elevates the chalice by the handles, Neval cum offertorio calicem per ansas, it says. And such a ritual is depicted on the golden altar um, in San Ambrogio Basilica in Milan, which is dated to uh, the... Um, he could use both hands to hold a tall, narrow, two-handled chalice of the cantharous type. It has a very prominent uh, flared rim. But by far the majority of extant early medieval chalices are without handles and consist of a foot, a stem, often with a knob at the join and a bowl. The, um, the proportions can vary considerably. The bowls can be wide and shallow, um, and that is, they are hemispherical or narrow and deep, that is, they look conical. The stem can be short or long. The foot can be conical or it can be just flared in a sort of open flange. The earliest examples from East and West date to the 6th century, and it is this shape which endures into the Byzantine and later medieval periods and even to the modern day. A representative example from the West is this Ursus chalice found in La Monfeltre near Trento. It's nearly 20 centimetres high and uh, just over 13 centimetres in diameter, and it has a donor scription naming the deacon Ursus uh, just underneath the, the rim. The bowl has high sides on a hemispherical bowl, and the inscription is placed between two lines uh, which have been inscribed uh, just below the rim. One of the most uh, important collections of early Christian liturgical vessels are those belonging to the 6th century Kappa Carion treasure. Three chalices from uh, this, this parish uh, are now in the Waters uh, Art Museum in Baltimore. That is the Theophilus Chalice, the Apostles Chalice, 
and the Simeonis chalice. The first of these, uh, the Theophilus uh, chalice, uh, has uh, a hemispherical bowl standing on a flared foot linked by a knop and the knop is a strange English word this is the knop that I'm referring to in English it's written as knop uh, here um, uh, the donor inscription of Theophilus and his sons is placed within a panel formed by inscribed lines just below the rim. And the rim is uh, slightly flared, so it comes out uh, uh, slightly. Um, so it's very uh, distinctive. The Apostles' Chalice is larger, uh, of a similar shape, although much more elaborately decorated. Uh, around the bowl, in relief and gilded, are four saints or apostles and two crosses with hanging jewels placed within an arcade and there are rosettes placed between each arch. Under the rim, again, we find the donor inscription with inscribed lines to the previous uh, chalice. So let's consider the affordances of these chalices. Firstly, the size of the chalice is related to the quantity of wine it could hold. Evidently, churches possessed large and small chalices for different numbers of recipients. And this is further supported by the use of these very large calyx ministerialis to denote these large uh, chalice for lay communion. The scholarly interest in the material and decorative features of chalices has meant that although the dimensions are recorded in the catalogues, only rarely do we find their volume. And of course, the volume of the chalice indicates use or helps indicate the intended use. Uh, Otto von Hessen measured the volume of four silver chalices uh, from um, Galognano in Italy. And the largest of this has a volume of over two liters, whereas others uh, range from around, um, to around uh, a quarter to three quarters of a liter. Uh, Ryan noted that the Ursus chalice, uh, this chalice had a volume one and a half litres. The Byzantine chalices uh, without handles have similar dimensions and weights to the second Golagnano, so we could assume that a chalice uh, such as this one um, contained about uh, uh, three quarters um, of a litre. But the largest of the Golagnano chalice, if it contained two litres of liquid, plus um, a, a chalice which weighs nearly a kilo means that the poor deacon needs to carry three kilos uh, around for communion. And then we have the issue of uh, that a, a shallow chalice um, can risk uh, the, the, such a large quantity of wine being spilt, but a very deep and high-sided chalice creates problems when you try to tip the chalice uh, so that people can drink from the bottom. So cup sizes are related to how much wine is needed, but also related to the ways in which humans might drink from them. The depictions of communion of the apostles in the Rosano Gospels and on the Reha pattern indicate that the head was bowed when receiving the cup. By bowing, the incline of the cup has become quite difficult to drink uh, from the bottom of a deep chalice. Because the laity drink while standing with the head bowed, the full chalice is designed to be held securely by the minister. Uh, the affordances and the canons indicate that it is not to be held by the laity. A chalice with two handles clearly requires both handles to keep it secure when full. So you hold it like that. Uh, the uh, a ch a chalice uh, without handles has a knob at the center, enabling the deacon to hold it firmly at the center of gravity. It's possible also that the deacon, as in modern practice, might tip uh, the chalice, holding it by the foot as well. And that enables uh, control of the amount of wine which is delivered uh, to each communicant, as well as keeping it secure. Uh, a chalice, uh, as we emphasize, is a vessel for drinking consecrated wine. And the affordance provide that an appropriate flow of liquid can be transferred to the recipient's mouth without spillage. For many cups, the position of the lips is guided by the rolled rim or flange. Uh, and this feature also serves to transfer the contents more securely to the mouth. The rim is sought out by the lips, 
which can touch the inscribed lines and the flared or rolled rim. And that as these are extremely common features, uh, it, it does indicate that they were intentional and not simply decorative. And in this, the image of the chalice uh, from the Milan altar, the rim is extremely prominent. It it's a very sort of key part of the chalice design. And I suggest that this is to uh, help the, um, the, the, the communicant um, know when to, uh, to actually drink from the cup. The chalices are often identified as, identifiable as a Eucharistic cup by visual and material means, which function independently of the Eucharistic liturgy. But it is not obvious um, that these features would have been evident to the communicant. Large cross on the Adar chalice, this one, would have been visible, I think, uh, to the uh, uh, communicant uh, when it's on the altar uh, and, um, and when it's presented. But this, uh, the figures of the apostles and the cross on this chalice might have been visible, but the identification of individual apostles um, was probably not possible. Dedicatory inscriptions um, would not have been visible during communion. Indeed, only when the chalice can be rotated freely, that is when it is empty and outside the liturgy, can these inscriptions be read at all. So this feature serves the donor's purposes in eliciting prayers on their behalf through the material presence of the object and not by uh, a reading or recitation um, of the petition by the communicant. Next I want to turn to um, some alternative uh, vessels. And firstly, the skiffus. A skiffus is frequently mentioned in the inventories of the Liber Pontificalis, and its function for lay communion is described in Order Romanus Primus. But precisely what form a skiffus had and what distinguished it from a chalice is unclear. The liturgical equipment provided for the Basilica of Equitius by Pope Syl Sylvester included two silver skiffi weighing 10 pounds each, so that they each weighed over three kilos as well as six uh, chalices of different sizes and two large silver ame. By implication, each of these items should have a distinctive use. Uh, Beatrice Caso suggested that the gold chalice was for the clergy, the silver chalice is for the laity. And Raymond Davis describes the ame, uh, which also appear regularly in other inventories, as vessels for collecting the wine offering of the people. Uh, so they're, uh, uh, like they're for collecting and not for distributing uh, the wine. A skiffus um, functions either as a container for wine or as a vessel from which wine is drunk. But how it relates to the chalice and the ame is not immediately clear. Davis proposed that the skiffus contained extra consecrated wine for when the chalices could not hold enough for a large congregation. But in order Romanus Primus, the wine is collected in a skiffus, and the communion of the laity is conducted with a skiffus using the straw, which I'm going to uh, discuss a little later. <clears throat> Ryan's suggestion uh, that a skiffus may have been a bowl type vessel could be supported with reference to the visual evidence. Since no item identified as a liturgical skiffus has survived. In this mosaic of the Empress uh, Theodora in San Vitale, uh, Ravenna, she's holding a very large bowl-type vessel uh, covered in jewels. And although uh, in my heading this is often uh, called a chalice, we can see that from the way in which she's holding it, this is much larger uh, than the sorts of chalices I've been showing you already. Um, and the question is, is this a skiffus? Um, is this one of these much larger, uh, larger bowls? Uh, in the uh, Rosano um, Gospels, as well as on the Reha pattern, Christ gives communion to the apostles using a large bowl type object. These bowls appear larger than chalices from the same period, and they have no handles, but as we can see, they need to be held securely uh, by two hands. Order Romanus Primus 21 includes skiffos et pugilares as part of the liturgical equipment taken to the stational church. 
Later, at the preparations for communion, the archdeacon receives from the regional subdeacon, pugilarem cum quo confirmat populum. And then as the Pope distributes the sancta, that is the consecrated bread, the deacon accompanies him with the jeweled skiffus. Uh, and, uh, and by implication, the pugilaris, which has previously been mentioned. There are no surviving early medieval straws or tubes and only a few later medieval ones, such as this 13th century example. They became redundant when the laity no longer the cup. It has generally been considered that there is no contemporary visual evidence either. However, since I spoke to uh, many of you in Batalha, I have found a skiffus uh, in a contemporary, uh, a, a contemporary depiction of a skiffus, um, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a straw, sorry, uh, on the altar. Uh, I noticed that one is clearly visible in this depiction of the community of the apostles on a Carolingian ivory citula, that is a liturgical bucket, uh, presumably for holding holy water um, uh, in the liturgy. Placed symmetrically on the altar, we can see our two uh, chalices uh, with Eucharistic bread. And just here is, a, uh, is a, a long, thin object, which I consider to be a Eucharistic straw. Additionally, we can see that just here at the edge has a distinctive protrusion towards one end in a similar position to the decorative handle on the medieval example. If I go back, you can see there is this handle. And here uh, we can see on this, um, this object uh, looks uh, similar to my interpretation. Even if there is a very little material evidence, there are sufficient references in church inventories uh, to the straws. It does seem that this unnatural way of drinking caused anxiety in the official sources, and this is suggested by the varied and unstable terminology for the object. It could be called a fistula uh, and calamis, which is more normal, but also a cana, sifo, dux, fugilaris, as we've already seen. Tancred Borenius and Michael Ryan indicated that church inventories recorded uh, many straws, in the 6th century, Desiderius of Auxerre gave 11 gilded canae to his church. And Ryan had found a, an inventory from Staffelsay of 811, which included a very small number of chalices, but 170 kalami. The evidence indicates their use particularly in Gaul as well as in Rome, and there is one reference to them from Astorius in the 8th century. It does seem that the lack of a consistent name uh, for the Eucharistic straw and of any contemporary theological or liturgical discussion of it, as well as the multiple straws in the possession of churches, that does suggest its introduction was a pragmatic solution to large crowds at liturgies, where it would enable several people to communicate simultaneously from the same vessel. How do the material affordances of the straw affect the ritual and sensory experience of communion? David Grummet in Eucharistic Materiality affirms the intimate physical encounter of the Eucharist. The straw is a bridge between human physicality and sacred, sacralized wine. Just as the straw establishes a direct connection between the mouth and the wine, it also acts to distance the communicant from the vessel which drinks the wine and separates Eucharistic drinking from normal, everyday drinking. And additionally, we note that unlike the quotation I began with from Cyril of Jerusalem, the communicant's lips would no longer have a residue of wine on them. Rather, the, uh, the wine is directed directly into the sensory and uh, organ, which is proper to drinking and taste, directly into the mouth. The straw raises the significance of what is drunk and also of the vessel from which is it drunk by these acts of separation, which restrict the communicants' sensory engagement with them. And I will just mention uh, in part, of course, in the East, uh, there are no straws, but there are spoons. Uh, and I think, uh, although they become commonplace uh, much later on, quite clearly in the uh, collections of church silver, um, there are often very many uh, spoons with 
uh, inscribed crosses on them. And it is more than likely, despite the protestations of Byzantine liturgical historians, that these spoons were indeed used uh, for communion. And, um, and the affordance of such a spoon um, uh, had, is, is similar to the straw, that it acts as a bridge uh, to the contents of the chalice, but also it's a distancing event that the, the, the laity are not to get that close. It, it, uh, it, it, it uh, both um, brings them closer and further away. And lastly, uh, just to conclude uh, my paper. Uh, so in this paper, I've tried to demonstrate or suggest a number of things. First, that we should not read liturgical sources in a way which assumes that the laity's experience of the Eucharist was identical to that of the clergy. Uh, but, and that the silence of the sources about lay ritual could be compensated for by the material and visual evidence. In our investigation, we have suggested that the affordances of chalices and other Eucharistic implements indicate how they were used in relation to human physiognomy and the sensorium. Thus, the objects themselves may reveal a ritual experience, which is not evident from the textual sources alone. Amidst the clerically dominated theological noise concerning the Eucharist, it is often hard to identify the laity as participants in the ritual at all. Attention to material culture, whether surviving as objects or only as textual and visual representations, shows that their participation was considered and provided for. The wine, uh, mixed with water usually, the body of Christ, was experienced via an intermediary material artifact. And this is in contrast to the bread, which was placed directly into the hand or even into the mouth from the pattern. Thus the affordances of chalices, straws and spoons may open up a way of exploring lay Eucharistic experience in these um, early medieval um, periods, centuries. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you, Professor Juliet. So um, we have now time for for questions. I think I haven't got here any in the, in the chat. So please feel free to to put your questions. Hi. Can I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, Katarina. Katarina, <laughs> Is everything all right with you? So, I have a, um, it was very nice to hear you. Thank you uh, once more. Um, it's not really a question, is, I don't know, I, I want to discuss this with you because you highlighted the size of the, the surviving chalices. Um, mm are smaller than the chalices that appear in the images in the various representations that you show. Mm. Do you think it was intentional mm -hmm. to highlight the scale of the chalices to explain their importance in the liturgy or mm. other explanation? We are always looking for explanations. So yeah. what do you think? Because just yeah. in the, the ivory citula, it's very close, the, the yeah, representation of the chalice is very close to the human hand. I, I measured my hand and I yeah. also measured the, the chalices that you've shown. So um, what do you think probably uh, to highlight the importance of the chalices in liturgy? Mm. Yes, yet it's very yeah. close to, the, to the, 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 the scale that you've shown to us. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, which I hadn't noticed. So thank you for that. And I will, I will borrow that idea from my paper. Uh, I will put your name at the bottom. But I think that's a really interesting observation, because if we think about the way in which um, the visual image is seen, um, they function um, uh, as symbols. And therefore, it's important just to, it, the detail is not immediate. That's a chalice. 
which we recognize by and say so they in this picture again christ is always you know he's three times the size of the apostles <laughs> and that's so that we make that immediate instant recognition and particularly on an object like a sidula which is going to be carried in procession uh, we are have a very privileged access to these images because we can make them bigger we can make them smaller we can see the detail but it's quite clear that uh, normal practice you just didn't see the detail you just saw the shape and you, and you make the recognition. And I think that recognition, ah, chalice, Eucharist. So here in the situla, we have the Last Supper. If you can see from uh, these, this image that uh, the situla contains biblical narrative. Um, so we have the nativity here, uh, but here is the Last Supper. But often the Last Supper is betrayed not as a supper, but as communion of the apostles. Um, so it's, depicted with uh, late antique, early medieval uh, Eucharistic equipment, <laughs> um, because uh, you have to make that connection with it. But I think that's, that's it's very true. And certainly in the previous, um, uh, where have we got? Uh, in this one, this chalice is enormous. But if, yeah. some, ch if some chalices could hold two liters of, of wine, you know, that's, that's big. You know, I mean, I've got, this is a, I've got a litre bottle here. <laughs> That's a lot of wine, um, if, it's, if it's full. So some of these challenges were really very, very big. Um, and the, um, the skiffus, if that is being used for the, for wine, if the skiffus weighs three kilos of silver, we're talking about quite a large object uh, uh, and that's why I think that what, um, uh, although this, again, your point is really that it looks very big object in, uh, in the image, but if, if this is a skiffus, uh, 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 and uh, it's a sort of object that could weigh three kilos of silver, it's going to be really, it's going to be prominent and dramatic. Um, and what's very, Interesting also that the, the little, ch uh, there's the, I haven't got a picture of it, the Gordon chalice, um, the little cantharous chalice from, from France is absolutely tiny. It's probably like, you know, the size of my hand. Um, and they think that was, was for monastic use. So I think there are so many different uh, shapes uh, and, and sizes of them, but uh, this point about the images, I think it is also, it's about the way we see it and the fact that we don't see correctly, especially when we see on the screen, that if you're in the if you're in San Vitale, you're going to be seeing from a quite some distance this image if you get to see it. And so you just need to see, ah, here's the Empress, here's a bowl, <laughs> it's, uh, and this is the this is a communion gift. Yeah, really interesting point. I'm going to think about that more, but uh, that's my immediate uh, response to, 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 to that. Thank you. Okay, more questions? Can, sorry, Joao? Si, si. Can I say something? Can I ask? Something? Yes, Susanna, yes, please. Hey, hello. Um, hello. <laughs> good afternoon. Hi. Thank Hi. you for such an excellent paper, Dr. Day. It was very interesting. Out of sheer Thank ignorance, uh, and because I come from that part of the world of uh, Byzantine, you said uh, the Byzantinists mm -hmm. do not agree on the fact that the spoons could be for communion, like straws. So, so may I ask, yeah. out, of, out of ignorance, yeah. what is it that they think it, they were for? If it's not for... Okay, for, let, me, uh, let me... Sorry. Yeah. Let's, let's get the spoon. No, I think it's really good. I was just wanted to uh, keep to the West and thought the spoons, we need to show spoons. But now what's really interesting is that there are... There are lots of Byzantine spoons. I mean, I think there's, there's hundreds of them. And somebody has, uh, uh, oh yeah, this Paula has made a catalog of Byzantine silver spoons. And he's the one who said that they either have a cross, an inscription, or a Cairo. There's always something on them uh, that's, uh, well, always, if there is some, some inscription, it's almost always a Christian type inscription. Um, now, the question is, are these uh, very early ones, these sixth century 
uh, spoons, does it show that in the sixth century, uh, that in Byzantium, uh, that the wine was administered with a spoon to the laity? Now, the consensus has been that this didn't really occur till around the 11th century. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, someone called Robert Taft, who is one of the great um, historians of the Byzantine liturgy, um, wrote a very um, vitriolic paper where he said, absolutely no, <laughs> absolutely no, um, uh, these weren't uh, used for, um, uh, uh, for, for, for communion at all. Um, and he's, the reason for that is he says, we have no textual evidence for it. Okay, that was his criteria, no textual evidence. But what I've shown in my paper is we have almost no of the laity receiving communion at all. Okay, um, so that doesn't seem to me to be a very good argument. Um, now, Marvia Mango, who's a Byzantine archaeologist, she noted uh, very interestingly that um, that the cross, when there's a cross on the spoon, it can either be like this this way, where the arm of the spoon uh, is at the same axis as the long arm of the cross. Uh, other spoons have the cross uh, the other way around. They have it so that the long arm goes on the sh here and the short arm goes there. Okay, if you can get that. Now, if we think of the affordances and how it might be used, if I take a spoon in my hand, I haven't got a spoon, I've got a pencil. If I take a spoon in my hand and I eat my soup, I drink it like that, okay? In which case, the cross needs to be that way, to be upright. If I, I am feeding you, if I'm feeding a baby, <laughs> or I'm giving you communion, I'm gonna put it in and I'm gonna give it to you like that. In which case, the cross needs to be but this way round, okay? And so she suggested, and I love, I really think this is a great way of looking at the affordances and their use, is that where the cross is like this, where it continues the line, that's what the communicant would, would, would see. Additionally, that in the Kappa Carion uh, treasure, uh, there are a number of spoons found with chalices. So we've got chalices, patterns and spoons in the same silver collection. Uh, which does seem to suggest that at least sometimes these might have been used for communion. Now, of course, how do we, we don't have any firm evidence for this, but it seems to be highly likely that that is indeed the case. Um, uh, but it's tapped to think that spoons were used very early on, um, that things that that's much later. Uh, a later uh, in invention. And completely independent uh, from what's happening in the West. We never get spoons in the West. Um, of course, somebody in the medieval will tell me that that's not true, but I've not, not found evidence for spoons in the West, and I have not found evidence of straws in the East. It's like a different solution to the same problem, uh, it seems to me. Yeah, but that's... Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, just a question also, do we have some, there are some differences or, or some specific or different rituals, for example, in, when the Eucharist is linked to baptism, for instance, mm. Um, mm. in the way, for example, the new baptized Christians are, accede to the, to the communion, communion, or if they drink the blood of Christ, is it different in those cases, do we have any and it traces off that or, or not? <laughs> no, not really. No. The, the, the text that I opened with was directed to the newly baptized and it does mm -hmm. seem like, uh, whereas it, when um, the bishop explains the ritual of baptism, he's uh, just explaining it, he explains it in a different way. There is less um, detail about ritual instructions because they had the baptism and now they need to be explained what it meant. But it mm -hmm. comes yeah. He's giving them very clear guidance about what to expect during the ritual. Uh, and these are clearly instructions about what to do when you come to communion. You know, you, you don't hold out your hands, you bow your head, <laughs> you touch your lips and things. So uh, this text was from the newly baptized. Um, the only difference that we can find is their position uh, in the Eucharist during the octave after baptism. 
uh, and uh, that they were positioned at the front of the church. So the newly baptized had a privileged position uh, in the week after uh, after baptism. But after that, I assume they just went to their particular position in the congregation. Um, but uh, no a special um, uh, way of receiving communion, because I think the point is, it's not that they're special, is that they have joined the community, they've joined the faithful. And so now, uh, they can, now they can be with everybody else, particularly in the early centuries, um, that the laity did, uh, if you were not baptized, you did not attend the Eucharist. You could attend the, the, the reading of the, of the scriptures, you could attend the um, uh, the preaching, the sermon. After that, you're out, okay? <laughs> and so uh, it, it's like a sign of your membership, a sign of baptism mm -hmm. that you are yeah. privileged to, to, to be there for the whole, uh, the whole event. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, once we move to infant baptism, well, of course, things then change completely. I mean, then, um, um, and then, then you have to have different, uh, different rituals, I think. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. More questions. I think uh, Rosangela put a question in the um, in the chat. If uh, the whole ceremony or all the ritual could be. Uh, read or um, looked through the point of the monumentality of its materiality, not only the, um, the liturgical vessels, but also uh, the, um, the other aspects, including the garments, for instance, yeah. and all the other aspects linked to rituals and to liturgy. Also, and mm. also as a kind of, in fact, it's uh, giving a distinctive um, status to the clergy and, uh, and more and more different steps to the clergy towards the lay people. Um, yeah, also, but I think. Yeah, I think that's a really it's really important, I think, to, 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 to say that because, of course, the, the stuff that we have that with the materiality that remains um, is it's the, it's the high status materiality. Um, the images that remain are the images of bishops and deacons, not of ordinary laity um, or of the rich donors of churches. And we don't really, you know, that, that whole visual um, uh, world that, that the laity entered into the churches, uh, the decoration on the churches, the uh, textiles, which we ignore uh, when we visit modern churches, that there were textiles hanging uh, between the arches in the colonnades. Um, uh, the the impact of um, of candlelight on mosaic, uh, which we go in and it's electric light, it's that stable electric light, but that candle, the, the effect of that, all these sort of sensory uh, signals coming to the to the worshipper um, are quite extraordinary, uh, and I think the the uh, there are so many sensory signals in the liturgy that it's extremely difficult for us to. Um, research the liturgy as a as a as a whole to, to, as a whole entity simply because you know we can co um, concentrate on the on the communion or we can concentrate on the uh, the visual environment or we can concentrate um, on the ritual movement or perhaps on the smells or the lighting on um, all these different things but we can't ever really uh, grasp the actual sensory experience. Of the laity in the church. Um, we can only try and guess at it and hint at it. Um, and um, I think it is Becerra Pencheva has done some excellent work on Hagia Sophia and the liturgy of Hagia Sophia uh, uh, church, and particularly with the uh, acoustics of the church and the effect of that extraordinary acoustics, uh, the reverberation which goes on for 11 seconds, which means you cannot speak normally, <laughs> you have to sing. Uh, and even if you sing, the sound gets messed up. That It's very difficult for us to experience that um, or even have an understanding of what that is. I think just having, what we need to try and do, I think as scholars is to, is to um, try to understand as many little parts of it and then see perhaps in 50 years time, our students and our student students can try to put together a more comprehensive um, uh, imagining or um, 
there's not really much sort of sensory imagining yeah. of, of, of the yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's yeah. not really imagining because it's trying to be yeah. concrete than that, but it does require imagination. Yeah. Um, and that, of course, is, is a skill that historians need to use to some extent yeah. um, uh, to, to try and recreate, uh, to try people have an understanding of that. Um, uh, of that. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly now in, a, in most Western cultures, is de-ritualized. We're, we're not sensitive to the power of ritual. And that also has an effect on the way in which we study these. We study them as objects, not as uh, objects that have a whole ritual power uh, surrounding them. And I think that uh, that goes both for, for this sort of stuff, chalices, still the gold, stuff, but also goes for things like, the, you know, uh, books and text and, uh, and fabric textiles and those sorts of things. I think that's, a, yeah. that's, that's a, such an important point about, um, about what we can access. And, um, yeah. And the whole multi-sensory uh, environment of liturgy, yeah. and the impact it had on people. In fact, um, it's very interesting. I, I remember some descriptions a little bit late in the Cluny community, where they produced texts exactly giving that idea that the liturgy in the monastery was something um, for its impact with the the, the yeah. smells, the light, the 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 songs and everything, people would experience almost to enter in another reality in the in the in the, yeah. the New Jerusalem or while they were entering into the church. And it, it's very interesting because we yes. don't have this kind of sensation of leaving the daily life and to enter in the in, the, in something that for people is completely different from their daily lives. Probably yeah. we don't don't have yet this kind of separation because in the 10th and 11th century they also listened a language that was no longer their daily language. So and it gave to them also uh, mm. even a greater sense of mystery of of that otherness <laughs> yeah. of and those texts and chants that weren't from their daily life. But I think it's very interesting. As you said, to, to, to see how this the experience of this materiality can mm. affect the, the sense that they have of the Eucharist. And yeah. It's very, very interesting. Yeah. 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 And I think particularly for medievalists, we find that 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 you know, once uh what is, is it around it's it's twelve hundred and something when the, the laity uh stop receiving the wine at communion. Yeah. And so it's very difficult for late medievalists to read back and remember that yeah. until 1200, yeah. the laity did receive yeah. the wine yeah. <laughs> because all the missiles have been changed to remove the laity yes. uh, from, or perhaps they weren't changed that much, but the presumption was uh, it's just for the clergy and that laity are increasingly removed from Eucharistic participation. But of course, in the early centuries, Eucharistic participation was normative for members of the community uh, and, and it was normal for them to be, uh, be receiving. And so we, we need to see how we move to this position where the laity are um, uh, cease to, uh, to, to receive communion. Yeah. And I think something like the straw, that distance, that, yeah. that by creating a bridge, to, to, already we've got the, the seeds of what will happen later on. I think already this distancing of the laity uh, from thing, and we can see it in the earlier canons about how close to the altar can the laity get. Um, again, this part of this, you know, yeah. the separation between the clergy and the laity. Yes, but at the same time, we have we have lay movements that start to um, to ask that possibility again to accede to both to bread and to wine. And also in the mm. Czech, yeah. for example, <laughs> the, the importance yes. of that and in the 14th and 15th century, in the Czech yeah, Republic. That's right. yeah. yeah, and and they came to a very unhappy end, if I remember. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but it's interesting for them to, to ask for it. Yeah, because uh, to see as, um, yeah. the cultural memory of that would have been lost by then, yeah. that they would have got it direct, not from a tradition of laity receiving, a ritual tradition, but from directly from from the Bible and from the New Testament to their yeah. own practice, not via this uh, the, the ritual uh, that, that's there in the medieval. I think so because yeah. by then, several hundred years later, lost that connection. The the the, the cultural memory has lost that. I think. 
probably the evangelical character of these groups and the idea to come back to the to the gospels and to yeah. the model of the yeah. gospels yeah yeah, yeah. it's yeah. by another way <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. yes. <laughs> other questions no okay so sorry, think, sorry. Uh, so, yes Susanna. no just just uh, to point to what you were saying joe about the the sensorial i mean in in i i am i'm a slavist so i work on on the, that part of even beyond <laughs> but there is like actually a chronicle in which uh the, M, the the ambassadors of the prince of kiev say that the true faith must be the one that is done in santa sophia because they were so absolutely flabbergasted by the experience of seeing liturgy done in Santa mm -hmm. Sofia, that they return and they say, no, we should not be following the Islam, we should not be Jews, we should, we should be what these people do because this is beyond belief. And it's it's what they narrate or they mm -hmm. think is exactly as you were saying, Joel, a full sensorial experience that they were completely um you know taken by so it's the power of liturgy actually they chose the faith mm -hmm. because what they choose is the liturgy of that of that form of christianity and it's really one example where mm -hmm. clearly um it was the liturgy what what called the mm -hmm. their attention at least that's why how the chronicle explains it of course yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think you can also see um, tomorrow the under I'm going to talk about Jerusalem and the liturgy in Jerusalem and how important and formative that was as, as to the the, the students but how in, uh, how important that was for um, uh, providing models of, of authentic real ritual for the rest of the church both east and west I mean it becomes like this sort of crucible for liturgical form and um, you know the experience of um, pilgrims to, to Rome, for example, and going to St. Peter's. And, uh, you know, they also have this overwhelming sense of the, of the place. I mean, these, uh, they, the, the physical size of these churches is also part of it, but also the acoustics and the visual and the, uh, just the, the impressiveness of it um, uh, has that thing. And I, I think how, how, I think liturgists have not really used sensory uh, studies and the sort of sensory, the, the new interest in this in sensory studies and are, are very keen to sort of promote it as a, a way of doing liturgical history and so it's a um, but a, I'm a bit of a lonely voice at the moment in my field I think. <laughs> so if there aren't any other questions so Juliet thank you very much for for being with us today We'll meet tomorrow again with the undergraduate students by 10. <laughs> um, and thank you all for, yes. <laughs> for being with us and uh, have a rest of a nice evening, evening and we'll meet tomorrow. <laughs>